speaker this morning is Carol Harris. Uh, her topic's mixed annual fodder crops for grazing animal production. Carol Harris is a research scientist with New South Wales DPI based at Glen Innes in the Northern Tablelands. Carol has over 30 years experience conducting field-based research in temperate and tropical pasture species uh, and agronomy, optimising grass legume pasture mixes to improve productivity and sustainability, soil fertility management and invasive grass weed management. Carol is the project leader of the MLA funded project Mixed Annual Fodder Crops for Grazing Animal Production. This project will evaluate annual mixed fodder species for suitability for grazing in Eastern Australia uh, in Eastern Australian livestock operations, looking at agronomy and production of single species crops compared to mixed species. Uh, Mixed species fodder crops have been investigated with their annual production potential quantified under variable climate conditions. The project has activities in Wagga, Tamworth, Glen Innes, as well as six producer properties across southern, central and northern New South Wales. So welcome, Carol. Thanks, Jeff, and thanks to the LLS, Riverina LLS, for inviting me along today. You might be wondering, what is a Glen Innes girl doing in Wagga? Uh, talking to you about mixed annual fodders, and as the day gets hotter, I may be wondering why I'm not back in the cool tablelands myself. But um, it's also sorry, this is the also interesting talking after Richard, because that's always a hard act to follow anyway, and some of the points that we probably are making are fairly similar. So um, bear with me if there's a little bit of replication. Uh, so as Jeff said, I'm the project leader of a mixed annual fodder crop project uh, looking at enhancing livestock production. Uh, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about the what, the why and the how of mixes. Um, also a little bit about our project and some of the preliminary results. We're about halfway through the project in terms of our experiments. So there's some early results coming out or some early trends, but we've still got a long way to go in the project. And then some of that learning to date from not only the results, but some sort of practical considerations as well. So as Richard sort of said, that a mixed annual fodder, well, in this context, a mixed annual fodder crop is a combination of different functional plant types. And we're typically we're talking about a cereal, a brassica, a legume component, and in my part of the world, in the north, uh, ryegrass, so that a grass, which I know is probably not going to be a component of your annual mixes down here. Uh, I should also point out that I'm, today I'm predominantly talking about winter annual mixes, but we have looked at summer um, mixes as well, so summer crop mixes as well, to um, fill a different sort of feed gap that we have in the north. But the main aim of these is, I mean, many people would be you know, comfortable with using a single species cereal crop to fill a feed gap, um, but we're using these different mixes to sort of refine addressing that feed gap and trying to give a more diverse and balanced source of nutrition for livestock over that uh, growing season of that annual fodder crop. It's to complement your other fodder sources. So, you know, if you've got perennial pastures or perennial pasture with some annual component, uh, if you use dual purpose crops, it's, this is just another tool in that package to try and provide fodder over, a consistent source of fodder over the, uh, the grazing season or the, or, or the year or when you need um, fodder at a certain time. And it's hopefully also gonna give you some resilience to climate variability and a bit more flexibility in your farming system and how you manage the different sort of fodder sources that you have. Um, some of the reported benefits, and I use the word reported because like the point Richard made, a lot of the information we have on mixes comes from overseas. There's very little information uh, from Australia. But we're talking about using that combination of those uh, species that I was talking about to try and extend the grazing period. So trying to get fodder in earlier. So if you've got a brassica-based fodder, you might try and get it earlier in your sowing window. And then you might have some later maturing species that will extend that growing season right through till the end of spring. Uh, we talked about the diverse growth patterns, or Richard talked about diverse growth patterns. So potentially you're using species that are gonna able to be 
accessing the resources at different times of the, the growing season or when different situations uh, allow them to become the more dominant component of that species. And overall, we're looking to try and get an increased biomass over that growing season. Some other reported benefits include a more balanced nutritional profile. So uh, those that have used a single cereal for feeding a feed gap will know that sometimes they can be low in calcium, high in potassium, so you get some sort of mineral imbalance which affects the metabolic um, disease profile for some of the animals. So by having a more nutritional pro a balanced profile, we're addressing some of those mineral imbalances and that you may get a, a, a reduction in metabolic issues in your grazing animals. High Quality forages are going to support, or supposedly support, uh, increased intake and increased live weight gain of the animals. And then we have some of the soil health parameters that uh, Richard alluded to as well, obviously the end fixation by the legumes. But as he pointed out, as these crops are quite short, then sometimes you're not going to get a huge benefit from that um, that neck end fixation because you may not have had the legume in for long enough or the legume mightn't be growing uh, actively for the whole grazing period. So potentially that's a, a, an issue that we're not really sure about. Uh, you get things like increased organic matter, increased infiltration. If you're using something like tillage radish, potentially you're gonna get uh, the radish growing down the profile, opening it up, preventing uh, compaction maybe getting some fertiliser down to depth, uh, so, so things like that. Uh, then some of the other reported benefits include things like being able to use those crops to address specific weed issues at termination of the crop. So, um, for example, in the north where I am, we're using them to try and clean up paddocks of Chilean needle grass, which is an invasive grass weed, so use the crop over the winter, do a particular spray in spring and then early summer, and then we're going in with a summer mixed crop as well. So there are potential ways that you can increase your flexibility to, to address some of those sorts of issues. But the challenges, as I said, is that most of the information we have comes from you, the farmers that are trying it, and I've already talked to a couple of people this morning that have been trying these mixes. Um, and then there's the information from overseas, uh, which Richard gave you some good examples of, but there's also some more specific studies in America that are looking at particularly mixed annual fodder crops for feeding a winter feed gap. Even in, in some of those papers, they're often review papers, so there's not a lot of data in them, even from some of the overseas information. So um, we don't really know a lot about how they're gonna fit into an Australian system. We don't have much in, like data. We haven't really um, ground truth them, I guess. Uh, we don't understand a lot about the economics associated with them as well. So there's a really distinct lack of knowledge there that we need to try to address. And then there's a few things around the logistics at sowing. So if you're trying to sow a mix that has uh, variable seed sizes, how do you address that? particularly if you don't have um, specialised equipment or you only have sewing equipment that's got one box. There's d issues around that. How do you come up with a compromised sewing rate? So there's all those sorts of things. There's very few options uh, for in-crop weed management. So if you've got a broadleaf weed problem and you're growing a brassica or a legume, some of your chemical options are going to be limited. So you really have to make sure that your weed control is good going into the crop and then have a termination point and a plan at the end of that crop as well. And then even though we may be reducing some of those metabolic disorders, by having a higher content of something like a legume or a brassica in the system, potentially you're going to have some increased animal health issues. And I guess some of those challenges link to the point that Richard made in that even though there's some benefits, you are going to need to have a different level of management or have different thoughts around the way you manage some of these mixes if you go down that track. So the whole um, project that we lead, or I lead, is looking at trying to put some data around some of those um, challenges or some of those questions on how they might work in an Australian system. So we ran a, a series of agronomy experiments. Uh, we actually had a sort of like a pilot year in 2021, 
at uh, Wagga, Tamworth and Glen Innes, but then we've, in the last couple of years, we've had sort of more serious set of experiments. And those agronomy experiments tended to be smaller plots, so maybe around each plot might have been about 40 metres uh, meter squared, and we would have had sort of, at each of those sites, we would have had eight to 10 treatments by four replications. So it was really trying to look at a range of different uh, mixes in comparison to a single cereal species control, looking at their dry matter production over the grazing season, looking at quality, um, and then just trying to come to terms with uh, some of those more basic agronomy issues like time of sowing, uh, soil depth, those sorts of, or sowing depth, those sorts of things. Um, so they were run locally, uh, Yerangili and Wallace Town in the last couple of years, uh, and then at Tamworth and Glen Innes, as I said. Moving on to sort of a bigger plot uh, sort of situation and trying to understand what happens in terms of animal production, we've run a couple of grazing experiments, one here at Wagga on the research station, and then one at Glen Innes on the research station, and those are scaling up and looking at sort of large plots, so sort of around that half a hectare to a hectare per plot, narrowing down the treatments to one or two or three, and then running uh, animals on those experiments for a limited time. But uh, So in the case of Wagga last year, it was 35 days, and in Glen Innes it was 68 days. So uh, sort of scaling it up a bit, putting animals on, trying to understand what was happening in terms of the fodder. So we did a range of fodder measurements similar to the agronomy trials. And then we did a range of um, animal measurements, including live weight gain, uh, taking blood samples for mineral composition of the blood, uh, rumen samples, and also urine samples. So trying to understand what was happening from the animal point of view as well. And then in, in sort of parallel with that, we ran sort of more commercial scale uh, what we call paired paddock or similar sort of design where we actually had a big paddock split it in two and had one sown to a single species and one sown to a mix and then the mix was determined by the producer where we were running the site and then running animals on that for a certain number of days as well. So looking at it at a bigger scale and then trying to understand the practical, more practical um, considerations that the farmers might encounter as well. So this graph is probably going to scare you a bit. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of information there, but I'm just going to try and give you a snapshot of some of the data that we're getting from these experiments um, to show the variation in some of the different mixes. So at this site, we had a pure cereal, which was wheat, and that is, let's see if I can work this. No, the point is not working. No, can't. Sorry. That's all right. Um, the top, top left hand is pure cereal, and the cereal is the orange color, and the weed is a yellow color. So at this particular site, they had a bit of an issue with sowing time and sowing depth, and the cereal didn't perform as well as expected and got uh, invaded by some weeds. The one below that is a cereal legume mix, so it was a wheat with uh, arrow leaf and vetch. Uh, and the legume component is the grey colour. And then the one below that is a cereal brassica mix, which the blue is the brassica. There's a tiny bit of cereal there and then a the yellowy sort of colour. And then following from that, we've got pure brassica, which is the big blue one right in the middle. And then below that, cereal legume brassica. And then brassica legume. And then over the side, we have pure legume and just a legume mix. So it's a bit complicated, but the graphs just show the kilograms of dry matter per hectare on the y-axis and the times that the um, plots were assessed on the x-axis. And it's just giving you an indication of the production over time. So the, the height of the curve is basically giving you the, 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 the um, biomass at each harvest date. And then the different colors are showing you how those different um, components of the mixes were performing. So some of the, the sort of key points to take out of that was the legume component was doing quite well and was um, providing quite um, a lot of biomass over the growing season in the treatments where it was. The brassica was starting to perform 
reasonably well quite early and, can, and went through into the spring. Uh, but everything kind of peaked around that fifth harvest date, which is sort of mid-October, but we still got some reasonable biomass into November. So uh, just showing that we had quite an extended growing season and that the components were all contributing, except maybe the cereal in this particular case wasn't doing that well. So if you contrast that with um, quality, so on the just left-hand side, metabolizable energy for a range of different treatments. Um, if you look at the top left-hand corner, that is uh, looking at uh, treatments that have a brassica in it, and you can see at that first harvest date that there was um, considerably more energy on a per hectare basis than the um, just this pure cereal alone, and then some of the mixes that had cereal in it as well. But once we got past that sort of second to third harvest, they were all following a similar sort of pattern with a few differences there. Crude protein is on the right, and you can see that, you know, as expected, we're following a downward trend as each of the crop mixes um, matured, but considerably more protein in any of the treatments that had a, a component of legume, and the more legume in that component, in that mix, the higher the protein is. So on the bottom left-hand quadrant there, you can see a solid black line that's quite a bit higher than the others. That's the pure legume treatment. Um, so yeah, showing much better protein. But overall, if not, um, it was a little bit higher or consistently the same as the cereal uh, over that period of time. So showing reasonable quality profile. Now, because we didn't have animals in this situation, but we still wanted to have some sort of understanding of how the, um, that might relate to animal production, uh, we used the data from that site and ran it through uh, the drought calculator to try and understand what the intake and the live weight gain could be, could be from that sort of situation. So here we're just comparing a brassica and a brassica clover. No, sorry, brassica, what's the C stand for? Cereal, sorry, the <laughs> brassica cereal and legume and uh, using the quality parameters and the yield parameters that we have. So if you just look at the yellow down the bottom, the yellowed out area, you can see at the first harvest date that the brassica actually had a higher intake and growth rate than the mix. Uh, there's no data there for the August because the actually the um, yield was, or the biomass in those plots was just kind of too low for the, uh, for the calculator to compute. But as we got from sort of early September through to December, you can see that the mix tended to have higher intake and a higher live weight gain. So not saying that that is actually going to happen, but there's potential for that to have a, a higher live weight gain based on these mixes. So that leads us into the grazing experiment at Wagga last year, where we had four treatments, a brassica, a brassica and a cereal, a brassica and a legume, and a brassica cereal legume mix. And that was replicated four times. So the plots were about, um, not quite a, a, I think they were about 0.33 of a hectare. We had six uh, lambs per plot, so a total of 24 lambs per treatment. And then we did the fodder biomass uh, on day zero, so the day we put the animals in, day 21 and day 35. And we also did the range of those animal measurements I mentioned before, so day zero, day 21 and day 35. We weighed them, took blood samples, urine samples and rumen fluid. So this is what the pasture or the fodder looked like over that period of time. So the top left hand is uh, the brassica only, uh, so the blue there. Uh, you can see that it was a slow decline in it over the 35 days. The other um, components or the other mixes are below that on the left hand side, the brassica and the legume mix. Um, two minutes, okay, so yeah. And uh, you can just see that there was a variation in the, in the quality of the pasture components there. Just quickly going through, at day 21, we did see um, a significant average daily gain uh, increase in the mixes compared to the, the brassica. 
Uh, the brassica actually fell out before the day 35, um, and so, but we, and we saw a slight difference between the different treatments there. Um, the on-farm validation sites, so they were in the southern part of the state, they were at Cadell, Quandiella, and Pleasant Hills. And you can see there that they were all compared to um, a single species of um, cereal, which was the wheat. And then there was various, a bit of variation in the number of animals and the days grazed and things. But basically, we did see some benefit of the mixes at all of those sites. Uh, not always consistent and not always, um, not always directly related to or directly re resulting in average daily gain, but in some cases we did. So there was a bit of mixed results, but overall there was benefits from the mixes over the, the control. Um, so just some of the things that we've learnt to date or we're picking up as we go along is to consider the time that you want the feed when you're trying to address the feed gap, so making sure that you're thinking about that. Choosing species and varieties that are suited to your climate, your environment, your soil, and your capacity to utilise it. So if you've not got the capacity to really um, utilise this feed, then um, maybe consider just um, increasing your capacity to utilise it. If you can sow early enough, the brassica and the canola will likely provide early feed. So if you're trying to address sort of a gap earlier in that autumn winter period, then you know, including a brassica would be useful. But if you're looking to extend that grazing season, uh, you might want to do some um, uh, later maturing species. Soil conditions obviously will have an impact. We talked about the sowing depth and the sowing window. Sow as early as you possibly can if, you, if you've got the moisture. Um, but in general, we were seeing some positive benefits, but we we're only early into the project, so we need to um, consolidate some of those results and, and keep on. Just quickly, it's a big project, larger number of people. I'd like to acknowledge that there's a lot of New South Wales DPI researchers involved, development officers and technical staff, but more importantly, we have a number of producers that help us uh, through their insights into a, a project reference group, and we have a number of producers hosting sites around the state. Um, so we really appreciate their, their input to the project. Sorry. Great, thanks, Carol. Um, we might just thank Carol. And again, Carol will be up in our um, question session after lunch, so... Uh, just take note of any questions you might have.